Hey everybody, and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program RP0. This is our uh, Twitch recap from uh, last Sunday's live show, where we were uh, letting our crew in low Earth orbit kind of bide their time, as we've spent uh, a couple of hours out here at uh, Jupiter, uh, paying attention to our uh, Jasper 1 mission, which is a uh, hopefully an attempt to gain some knowledge about the uh, atmospheric conditions of Jupiter and uh, hopefully radio back in some of these uh, data point things. Uh, this is our little drop probe which was separated from the Jasper 1 mothership uh, about half a year ago and it is about a day away from making its uh, encounter with uh, the Jovian atmosphere. Uh, quite unfortunately the mothership is way ahead in its orbit and will not be relaying comms which was kind of essential to this mission. It's just, it's way ahead. Anyway, uh, here's old me live during the show. Quite sad indeed. Well, uh, there goes a lot of that plan. I guess we're just going to have to uh, turn it around and see how well it survives. Maybe it'll come out the other end and we'll have a chance to reboot it. But, uh, let's get you facing a prograde little guy. Separated a lower position. Yeah, I think uh, next... The next time we do this, because this thing has a, a surprisingly good amount of delta V for, I mean, it's just these four thrusters and this fuel tank, some sciencey bits. So I think we can actually afford to jettison this thing at a much lower uh, point in the altitude from the mothership, the uh, the secondary one anyway. That's why we bring two. That's why we bring two. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint, SimG. But yeah, I think uh, that'll be the plan for the secondary one, is to keep the mothership much closer. Let's uh, radial in a bit. Burn off a lot of fuel. We have a lot of fuel to burn. <laughs> so I think this thing could actually make the maneuver. Either that or we need to slow the mothership way down and bring it into a... Uh, well, we need to make its orbit not so eccentric and then raise it up a whole bunch uh, so that it can have uh, better station keeping or better uh, connectivity. Uh, only moving at a mere 54 kilometers per second. Uh, not dropping our periapsis a whole lot, but I'm hoping it'll be enough to uh, invite a very thermal reaction. All right, I think uh, that should be good enough. Electric charge holding out rather well. Let's see what the hell happens here. I'm just going to hope and pray that maybe we can collect... A oh, I mean, we didn't collect a connection, but wow, look at that. I want to know where on the map we are. Oh, yeah. No, we're, we're probably not going to survive to the day-night Terminator, but... What a, I mean, if we did, hey, there's Mars. We could totally bounce a connection to there if we had it. Where's Earth in re re uh, relation to us? Just on the other side of the sun. So, yeah, if it, if we did have a satellite in directly above us, we could totally bounce a signal to uh, pretty much anywhere. Are we atmospheric? We are. Let's uh, point prograde there, little guy. And point prograde and hold, please. Uh, did I see what you are talking about on the Discord earlier? Uh, probably. Might need to be more specific, however. Um, the RCS stuff. Uh, Mars is on the horizon. And we have a six-crew vessel out there with a remote guidance unit. So even if we couldn't get direct LOS to Earth, we could beam it to Mars and control from there. Shave like 10 minutes off of our uh, signal time. And that is pretty. I, I'm really mad we're not getting any uh, upper Atmo science. We're also not ablating, which is interesting. The use of SKS, building Mars, Venus missions, and LEO, stuff like that. Yes, I did read over that, actually. And uh, it is a conversation worth having, although the uh, the disposability of larger spacecraft was something I was trying to avoid. 
but uh, I don't think it's feasible, honestly, to not have to just throw away big chunks of spacecraft. And when we come to doing really deep space stuff, like if we ever wanted to get a crew around Jupiter, uh, it would absolutely need to be built in orbit. There's no way we could do launch stuff uh, at that kind of scale, even for us, even if we were to put one lone Kerbal on the loneliest mission to spend two decades in space for Jupiter landing when? <laughs> Tomorrow night. No. Dumping the big dumb tanks is fine. Uh, agreed. I just uh the lower impact or the reusability uh, not reusability but the recoverability of spacecraft seemed really appealing because it does save us money and um well I just I took a contract not too long ago I took two contracts. One of them is for a Europa landing, uh, uncrewed, of course, which gave me like a three million of that. Uh, when I started recording footage yesterday, I had 150,000 kerbucks, and that was it. That's what I meant when, like, the space program is flat broke. Which is why I've got a, a couple of SKS flights lined up. Those alt attitude thrusters are adding more kinetic energy to the orbit than you're losing from drag. <laughs> are they really? Oh, come on. We're supposed to be... Oh, we're already on the way back up. This did not burn up and explode. You have failed on all fronts. You could not make connection. You couldn't ablate, and you couldn't explode. Let's go ahead and lock these thrusters. Why is making things explode at Jupiter so incredibly difficult? Turns out it is just uh, way more difficult than I would have anticipated. But we have a second drop probe on the uh, Jasper mothership that uh, hopefully we can time a little bit better. These little drop probes have a lot more delta V than I uh, initially anticipated. So I think we can actually release it closer uh, to its encounter with the atmosphere and have it just uh, burn retrograde or even radial in to try to adjust its course to be well within Jupiter's atmosphere so that hopefully we can get some good data back from it. We did use these uh, thrusters here to make sure this thing wasn't going to eject from the Jovian system, which uh, came as quite a shock to me, uh, but I, yeah, I just... I don't quite get it, but with it secure, we'll lock the fuel tanks and uh, put it back into hibernation mode for its uh, next lap. Maybe we can get one where it will actually have comms with something. This, of course, is the uh, Jasper 1 mothership, uh, magically way ahead of uh, its orbital path. Then it's uh, dropped probe that was in a lower orbit. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me either, but it is what it is. So we're plotting out a node to lower its orbit considerably uh, so that it can be moving at a better relativistic speed with the uh, second drop probe whenever we should separate it. We're going to try to circularize it out a little bit. We've got lots of delta V in this thing. Uh, originally, its mission intent was to uh, drop these little atmospheric probes, be the relay so that they could transmit all their data home, and then uh, maybe even... Uh, burn back for Earth and see what we're looking at as far as uh, recovery speeds from returning from Jupiter. You'll notice that other little little craft up top with a heat shield and no real science equipment, but it does have independent comms. So worse comes to worse, I think the uh, return to Earth portion has been scrubbed due to insufficient delta V. We did have to uh, turn and burn on our initial capture at Jupiter. Our, our aero capture plans were thwarted by not uh, sinking deep enough into the Jovian atmosphere to actually capture, which cost us a couple hundred delta V. There's also a course correction on the way out here that was like a kilometer per second. That's probably what actually scrubbed the return portion. But if our secondary drop probe doesn't work out, we might have a tertiary we can fall back on. And well, so uh, with all of those plans kind of uh, falling apart on me, we had to uh, jump to the very next thing uh, that's on our Kerbal alarm clock list while we're still letting our shuttle crew uh, maintain the 10 or 12 days or something uh, in order to fulfill the contract uh, for low Earth orbit so that we can make some money. 
And uh, it turns out the very next thing is uh, our Mars launch window. Uh, we have a few things going out, the most essential of which is uh, this launch here going up on a DN6, I do believe. This is a uh, resupply pod Charlie. This is our uh, life support container. We did just ship two of these successfully to Venus for Ostrich Station. We've had uh, one of these on site at uh, Harmonia Station for quite a while. Uh, it's actually been topped off once. So I think my estimation a few episodes ago about uh, one of these being able to supply uh, three crew for a decade might have been a little off, although I guess I'll have to check the numbers. We currently have six crew on Harmonia Station. And uh, due to what I can only call a VAB error, uh, we started pitching south in, 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 instead of instead of east, or maybe it was north. Anyway, it was not the direction we wanted to go. Um, yeah, uh, I I think I, I just rotated the uh, Charlie pod in the VAB when I made some updates to it and uh, updates to the launch vehicle. The original group of these launched on a much older model DN6 before the uh, one the RD172 upgrades and before the uh, HG3-B upgrade to the uh, B upper stage. Um, there's booster sep, fairing sep swiftly following it, and so now we can focus in a little bit and activate our comms, make sure that we uh, have good radio contact with Earth. It'll be pretty essential, at least until this thing gets to Mars and can operate through the uh, onboard remote tech guidance unit that is uh, included on Harmonia Station. Or oh, really, it's included on Chestnut, the... Uh, crude vehicle that brought them there. Harmonia Station itself has no remote guidance unit, although we do have a plan to fix that. We actually did bring one of those units along with us in our cargo container on, on board Chestnut, and uh, we just have to muster up a few Kerbals brave enough to go outside and try to bolt it to something, and whatever it is that we're going to bolt it to that has... Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that in a future episode, I promise. It's just one of those uh, kind of tedious EVA things that I've had uh, on the books for a good long while. I just actually bothered to check my notes recently and realize that, oh yeah, that's a thing. Uh, and that's a thing we should probably totally go do. So uh, we have achieved orbit. The core stage has been separated. It is down and away. The um, B upper stage has been booted. The uh, solar panels are deployed. The radiators are active. Comms, of course, are already turned on. So we're going to go ahead and start making our plot for Mars. This is a very, very off-plane transfer. As you can see, our node here is... I don't know, what's that, like 20 some odd degrees away from our prograde retrograde vector plane. So uh, it is kind of expensive as far as uh, Mars transfers actually go. Uh, I mean, yeah, 4.193 kilometers per second. Uh, I think uh, each subsequent launch after this, this is going to get a little bit cheaper as we move a little closer to the plane of Mars, but... Uh, the transit duration also exceptionally long at one year and ten days. Um, it's a little bit longer. I'm glad we're not sending a crew to Mars this window. That would be uh, a little out of threshold for most of the vehicles uh, we want to field a crew with. But uh, we're treated to some very enjoyable eye candy here. But uh, the B upper stage has been lit. Uh, provided, of course, we don't see any failures on that uh, HG3-B upper stage. We are well uh, on schedule to actually put this vehicle on course for Mars. The Delta V is actually within budget. We'll be uh, left with a little bit in the uh, B upper stage to start a slowdown maneuver once we arrive at Mars. Well, of course, the bulk of uh, the capturing duties will be provided by this heat shield that really sh could be stripped of some of its ablator. And we actually stand to save uh, possibly tens to a hundred and some odd plus Delta V by removing uh, as much as 88 or 80 percent of that uh, ablator from that top heat shield. We don't really need it for Mars. Venus, absolutely. We could I don't know, based on the last two captures we did with these things, and then after many, 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 many very high orbit arrow braking passes, I think we could probably get rid of 10 or 15% of it at Venus as well. But uh, I'm not sure I feel safe doing that. It would require, of course, making a special designation for ones going to Mars versus ones going to Venus, whereas 
until this idea I came up with. They were just carbon copies of one another. And uh, I think during the live stream here, I was actually talking about our old asteroidy buddy. This uh, GCH-222, codenamed Boris. Uh, that was the asteroid that was captured into a very eccentric Earth orbit uh, many, many episodes ago. We actually sent a crew out to it. We did a bunch of science on it. Uh, and then we just kind of left it there. And uh, at some point, it got uh, scooped up by the moon's gravity again and ejected from the uh, Earth-Moon system into a solar orbit. Um, I actually went back to it because we left a bunch of scientific equipment uh, attached to the asteroid, thanks to Kerbal Attachment System, and a controller core. Uh, so I figured, hey, now that it's in a uh, a different space biome, you know, like, you know, in orbit high over the sun... We could probably repeat some of those experiments and get some more science. Uh, unfortunately, when I did this, something exploded. The Kraken laughed, and now Boris is being ejected from the solar system uh, along a very southern trajectory. It makes no sense to anyone, but um, the Kraken usually doesn't. So, unfortunately, I'm never going back to that asteroid ever again, and as soon as it can just be done, I will probably delete it from the save file. Uh, there was a small correction burn to uh, bring us a little bit more in line with where we would like to be as far as our Mars capture plans. Uh, you'll see our course is still just a little bit off, but we're going to reset and replot our node now that it's really just kind of a plane change thing. With uh, Harmonia Station targeted, we'd like to uh, again line that periapsis up with our ascending or descending node whichever one applies, so that we can make uh, any uh, plane change maneuver out at our hop hypothesized uh, apoapsis after making a uh, arrow capture. So uh, we do want to preserve some ignitions. Uh, this engine comes with five. Uh, I think we used uh, one to eject and then one to course correct. And then I think I had a misfire in there somewhere where I didn't quite uh, allege the motor appropriately. So this last uh, seven and a half meters per second, we're going to have to make on the back of RCS uh, just to make sure that we can come in on the correct side of Mars and uh, hopefully with a pretty good alignment. So uh, we'll dump some of our RCS fuel from our uh, Charlie life support pod uh, into the B upper stage, wiggle it around a little bit, and then uh, try to work off this last little bit of Delta V. Uh, I was kind of tired of messing with it. So that last little bit of correction will be done upon our arrival. And with the Kerbal alarm clock node set, we will uh, jump back to the KSC where our second launch of the live stream is already rolled out to the pad and waiting for us. Uh, unfortunately, someone forgot to turn on the launch clamps and uh, keep this rocket fueled. So while it's been sitting here for a little while, waiting for its relative inclination with the moon to reach an appropriate level, uh, it's just been venting liquid hydrogen out into, you know, wherever. <laughs> So uh, this is another resupply pod for Harmonia Station. This is the uh, Lima pod type M-E. This carries uh, kerosene and liquid oxygen to refuel the uh, Chestnut spacecraft so that it can make its return from Mars and bring the crew safely home to Earth. Uh, we really hope anyway. Now, given the off-plane nature of uh, Mars during this window, I thought that uh, maybe we'd just try to compensate for that during launch by ignoring entirely our relative inclination with the moon and just going at uh, someplace close to where I thought maybe we could do a little better and uh, scrub a couple meters per second off that delta V transfer. So we're just going to kind of lean into it a little bit. This, of course, is an updated DN5. It's got uh, three RD172s on the boosters and four uh, RS25 DE main engines on the core stage. And uh, we'll just lean into this as we come up on booster sep. They are down and away. I just wanted to uh, double check that everything did, in fact, get fueled as we will eject the fairings and uh well just in a 
a little bit of a change up here. Uh, I will say that I did launch another one of these exactly identical missions uh, after the live stream, so uh, we can get some engine sounds now because I don't usually get that with the Twitch recaps. So uh, we'll switch to a little bit of picture in picture here because it makes it easier rather than making you watch the exact same vehicle uh, launch at nearly the exact same time uh, twice. We'll just uh, we'll go through them both at the same time. The live stream version there in your bottom left hand corner and the one I flew uh, all by my lonesome up in the, uh, the top right. Uh, both missions went, uh, well, flawlessly, I should say. Uh, I don't want to really ruin this launch footage for you, but I'll tell you that uh, both flights were able to uh, achieve orbit uh, without uh, even so much as a hiccup, although our diverting away from the uh, lunar plane uh, on the live stream did not uh, pan out exactly as well as we wanted to. It wasn't tragic. Maybe we did save some Delta V, or maybe I was just seeing the savings from it being uh, three or four days later, um, and us being a little closer to the ideal position for this particular Mars window, which uh, in really the broad sense of everything isn't really all that great. Uh, the best Mars windows are the ones where you just uh, adjust your plane right away. Anyway, our bottom left core stage has uh, completed and we will round out the orbit a little bit uh, on our B upper stage. So maybe I was mistaken earlier about being low on ignitions. Maybe this is the flight where I'm low on ignitions. That would make more sense considering there was a little puff there to uh, circularize. That did cost us an extra ignition. Oh well. Anyway, uh, now on our top right footage, the core stage is down and away. We are actually in orbit, so uh, we know that the prior mission not being able to hit orbit was uh, entirely due to pilot error, uh, as, as per usual. But uh, we'll just get our nodes set up for our transfer burns on both flights and then uh, start to warp around until we can go ahead and make our ejection burn. Uh, both of them would end up going, well, like I said, surprisingly well. Both of these flights are on their way to Mars, and I really hope they both survive re-entry or capture and we can do a successful rendezvous and docking because we need both of them to show up if we have uh, any chance of fully fueling Chestnut so that he can make its uh, return voyage. Um, these pods were developed as an alternative to the larger Lima pod that would uh, normally launch on a Hasselhoff lifter. We tried to send two of these to Venus uh, in our last Venus window. Um, Either of them would have made it, although I'm pretty sure their telemetry was cracking because I would not have left them with such a ridiculous deviation away from the planet. But uh, considering I did it on a live stream and I couldn't really remember where I left it and I sped up the footage in post and don't have the raw files, I just kind of had to eat my shoe on that one and uh, let it be as it, as it turned out in the... Uh, in the game. I don't. I can't prove it was Kraken. I can't prove I didn't just screw it up. So, it is what it is. They were not mission critical as far as getting a crew out to Venus, so both were uh, left to be abandoned. Uh, these were the... These M-E pods are a smaller variant of that spacecraft that was developed because we could not push the kind of tonnage that the, the Lima primary is all the way out to Mars. And uh, aside from that, we had absolutely zero chance of being able to aero capture them at Mars. Um, the upper limit for what we can aero capture, based on how big of a heat shield we can bring around, is about a hundred tons, and that's really kind of pushing the upper limit. There's a there's a floor at how low I'm willing to go on an aero capture maneuver at Mars, and it's about 32 to 35 kilometers periapsis. Uh, and that's because 
Harmodia Station is in such an orbit that takes it very close to a very large mountain, and if you come in much lower than that, you stand a very good chance of uh, arrow capturing into the side of a hill. Uh, litho breaking, I think, is the term we're, we're, we're looking for there. So it's, yeah. So, the Limapod primary, too heavy to arrow capture, too big to ship there. These Lima MEs were developed as a smaller variant of that, as something we could actually push to Mars so that we have any chance of refueling Chestnut, which is why it takes three of them instead of just like one and a half, like the normal Lima pods would actually take. And I uh, did not really want to use the big BPR rocket that ships Chestnut out there, although that would probably be the most effective way to send a whole lot of kerosene and liquid oxygen uh, out to Mars. It's just entirely too expensive to warrant every single uh, chestnut mission needing like four support flights of the same half million credit rocket. So, yeah, that's it. This is why we are where we are. So, both missions now setting up their correction burn to bring their courses in uh, a little more in line with where Harmonia Station resides in its orbit. Uh, again, trying to line up that. Um, ascending or descending node with the uh, periapsis of our moment of arrow capture, or at least what will be. I think both will need a correction as we enter Mars SOI, just to kind of bring things into a little bit more, uh, well, bring things in a little tighter so that we can actually uh, arrow capture effectively and still be on plane. Um, and it's really, it's also so that we can more tightly control our altitude for aero capture. Uh, both of these missions are going to have a, uh, a, some fuel left, uh, in that B upper stage that of course, um, we're totally not going to let that go to waste. Uh, if we can shave even half a kilometer per second or so of, uh, Delta V that's needed to capture into Mars orbit by lighting that HG3 one last time, then, uh, so be it. <laughs> that's exactly what we're going to do. It does uh, take some stress off of me as far as how low we have to pit these things in the atmosphere in order to make capture. Um, the Charlie pods, the life support pods, really do need to go just about as low as we can get them. Either of these, they're uh, a little lighter. Uh, I think coming in at 80 tons. We'll still need to push it in pretty low, but uh, it... It is a little bit easier when you don't have to worry about piling into terrain to make it such a thing. So with uh, both missions on their way, uh, I did jump out to Harmonia Station, but we'll save all of that for uh, another episode. That's going to do it for this one, everyone. Thank you so much for hanging out. I really do appreciate it, and I will see all of you in the next one. So until then, see you later.